Creek. Hi, everybody. All right, well, welcome. Um, we are gonna get started. I'm really excited about the topic today. We are going to focus in on some really influential women artists at Meyer Gardens um, and uh, give you a little bit of history of the feminist movement and what feminine, feminism means to each of these artists. And uh, we have our very knowledgeable and talented curator of arts education, Amber Oudzema, is going to be our presenter today. And before I turn it over to her, I just have a couple of Zoom uh, functions here. So we want your participation in the chat today, just like you told us where you're from. We're gonna be asking you to take a close look at what you see of some of the sculptures that we have here and also other works by these artists. So when you see this magnifying glass, be ready to type in all of your observations. There's no wrong answers. Tell us what you see. And then we're also curious to hear what you're wondering about. So when you see that little thought bubble, tell us what you're thinking or what questions you have. Um, and then type your answer in the chat uh, of Zoom. And there's one more thing here in your chat window um, where it says two, right above where you'd be typing your response. There's a little carrot, little arrow. If you click that and change it to all panelists and attendees, that means everyone that's here today can see what you're typing. If you have it to all panelists, then it just means that Amber and I can see what you're typing. So change that to attendees as well. And I'm gonna go ahead and turn it over to Amber. And I'm gonna stop sharing and let you go right. ahead and share your screen. Thanks, Carly. Let me get to share my screen. And for those who might be watching on Facebook, um, there is just a little delay, but you can also make comments in there and um, we have somebody from communications who'll be sharing those with us as well those comments oh i can't talk and do things at the same time so here we go Okay, so the first thing that we want to start with today is um, kind of just looking at what feminism is, and then we'll look at what feminist art is, and then we'll look at some of the pieces that we have here on Meyer, at Meyer Gardens that have been labeled feminist and um, have a conversation about those pieces. So feminism um, there is discussed in waves and it really boils down to the belief in social, economic and political equality of the sexes. Um, so the first wave came with the right to vote in the early 1900s and that was passed into law in America in 1920, I believe. Um, then the second wave comes in the 1960s and that uh, movement really happens at the same time as civil rights movements and anti-war movements and protests. And that one really focused on reproductive rights and equal legal and social rights. Then the third wave starts in the mid 1990s, and that's a continuation of and a reaction to the second wave feminism um, with a focus on equal wages, equal treatment and equal respect. And I think that the bulk of people who call themselves feminists are really looking for that last one in the third wave, that focus of equal wages for equal pay, equal treatment and equal respect in particular. So when it comes to artwork, um, this is a topic that's quickly picked up, uh, in particular by women artists, and they are seeking to challenge the dominance of men, both in art and society. So for a long time, it was only men, really, who could become artists, um, and then who, if if they were artists who would be um, highlighted in museums and um, they would be paid more and uh, treated differently, um, but also in society. So they wanted to gain recognition and equality for women artists and to question assumptions about womanhood. So um, we chose a couple of examples that are, are pretty prime from um, this time period in the 1980s and 90s. Uh, Barbara Kruger on the left there 
this is an untitled piece, but a lot of people just incorporate the words that are there. And she's using semiotics, which is a study of language. And she's adding that to the visual here. There is uh, an image of a woman's face and it looks like it's made out of marble. So that refers back to even ancient Greece when the sculptures were made out of marble and it, they were focusing on the ideal beauty, the ideal aesthetics. Um, so there is a bit of that concept of how women today face pressure to live up to that idealized beauty. And then the words mean something more than just uh, what we automatically think of when we see it. So let's look at a couple of those words. Your gaze hits the side of my face. The word gaze is something that really came um, into question around this time as well on, in the art world of the male gaze. So this idea of men who are creating artwork of women uh, for men. So men are creating it and men are looking at it. Um, and they're interpreting what a female's body should look like and kind of the role of what women should do. So that, ga that word gaze, rather than look or view or any other um, synonym for looking at um, is a very conscious choice. And then the word hits. So you're looking at my face, but it's a, a, a really aggressive word, right? Hit, when we think of uh, as a physical, a verb, um, really then references um, abuse that happens sometimes in relationships and how um, men for many years have been able to hit or abuse women um, and become violent with women. And that has just been kind of um, not worried about, not a concern, like that's just how, how things happen. So this idea of, and then again, the side of my face rather than um, me as a person um, and in conjunction with the word hit, it really brings to mind a visual of a woman being hit in her face. So that's uh, Barbara Kruger and she has, she has many different, um, kind of collage looking pieces like this. Uh, and then on the other one on the right is Janine Antony's. Um, this is a from, from a performance called Loving Care. And Loving Care, it was a brand of hair dye. I'm not sure if it still exists, but that is what she used as a medium. She dipped her hair into that bucket that is behind her filled with hair dye. And then she mopped the floor with her hair. And you can see the feet of people behind her. Uh, this was a performance that she did um, in a gallery space and people um, came in. This is, uh, I believe, on canvas that she put all down and she mopped the floor of the gallery with her hair. So the, there are some references to gender roles there of how women are assumed to be the caretakers of the house and cleaning is one of their just automatic roles and one of their jobs um, and then also these standards of beauty and that women are expected to maintain a youthful appearance and therefore um, most hair dyes in the store are made for women and we see images of women wearing this color of hair so um calling the both of these women artists are calling into question um what a role for a woman should be and um all, while also thinking about the differences of how men and women are treated in society so from there i think we can kind of jump into a few of the artworks on um, 
uh, on our grounds at Meyer Gardens. And I just want to mention that these three artists that we'll be zooming in on um, at, at different points in their career, they have all kind of said, they've kind of eschewed that term, that label of feminist artist, um, because not all of their work is specifically related to women's roles in society, um, but certainly we, we might be able to see a connection and that's where we're kind of focusing in on today. Okay, so I'm gonna play this short clip of uh, this sculpt sculpture. And I want you to think about, and when you feel comfortable, um, write in the chat very simply, what do you see? All right. Yeah, and if you want to advance, oh, Kelly says spider. So a few responders have said spider. A creature trying to free itself, says Michelle. Mm. A spider in the natural world. I'm wondering what you see, um, it was Michelle, that, that makes you say that. Um, a creature trying to free itself. What do you see that makes you say that? Martha says spider with egg case. So you're noticing the eggs mm -hmm. there. Yeah, it's a little bit difficult to see in that second photo, um, but there are eggs in that, uh, almost looks like a cage. Mm -hmm. Spider with open ribs. Mm. Any other details that you um, notice about the spider or the texture or? other aspects of the sculpture. Um, Facebook says, I noticed the cage-like structure below the spider. Is it an egg sac? Mm -hmm. Seems to be stuck in the concrete. The bottom of the legs are elongated. So you're noticing the shape of the legs. Yeah, since none of the legs are up, that means that it's not in motion. So perhaps it's stuck and trying to free itself, mm -hmm. I see. Um, oh. And yeah, good observations on the egg case or egg basket or egg sac. So we're, we're noticing this is a female spider, yeah. Deborah says she likes how it casts a great creepy shadow. Mm, I like that too. Protective legs of the egg case. Right, so those legs that are coming out and down, they do protect that egg case. It makes it harder to get in there if you were to steal the eggs. Oh, I've never thought about the, the shape of the legs being protective of the egg case. Like I've always focused in on the fact that the case looks like a cage yeah. and that it seems very sturdy, but yeah, and thinking about the legs, being also protectors and still and as a stance would be a protective stance. And that cage, yeah, it could it could mean both that it is keeping those eggs or the babies trapped in there, but at the same time, it's also protecting them as they are fragile and um, and young. Does anyone have any questions about this sculpture or wondering? Yeah, what thoughts do you and wonder? wonderings. And knowing that this is a mother spider, does that affect how you uh, feel about it or think about it or wonder about it? So we'll give you a moment to put that in your answers or questions in the chat. 
I don't know about you while we let uh, folks have a minute to think, but this, this sculpture definitely evokes a um, ominous feeling for me, but it's not just the idea of the spider, it's the texture of the sculpture is, is quite rough on the legs. Um, yeah, the texture and I'd say that like the line and shape that it is not quite curvy it's very angular which gives that that feet that cold feeling like machine like um and those legs come down to a dainty well some might call it a dainty point mm -hmm. could also be a sharp point which is kind of ominous i think Oh, it says, Michelle says, why a spider as a best representation of motherhood? Wondering how the artist connected these ideas mentally. Well, I think that's a really great segue to give you a little bit more historical context here. So, and I, if, if I'm sure there are some volunteers watching and that are a little bit familiar with this piece, but um, Louise Bourgeois created a series of spiders and um, she's, did them to honor her mother and her mother was her best friend and she described her as dainty neat useful as a spider but also someone who could really protect her um, and her mother worked in a tapestry repair business so she was a weaver herself So does that change how you feel about the piece at all? Did we get a couple of new chat? Um, yes, someone also shared that the legs remind them of branches or resemble branches. branches. Okay, kind of branching out. Um, someone then, has pointed out to me that they kind of look like knitting needles. Oh, yeah. And on Facebook, Nancy says, when I saw the egg sac and realized the spider was female, my thoughts went to protectiveness, but also defensiveness. Someone else used the word ominous. And then the context helps me to make more sense of the work. Sure. sure. And what does the artist say about it? Linda's asking. Yeah. Yeah, so we know that the artist connected it with her mother and definitely with some of that protective kind of nature. And the question I usually ask on this piece is, do you think after hearing that story that it is the spider looks dainty and neat and useful or protective and fierce? And can it be both? And I'm wondering too, if anybody, when they first saw Spider, either in this image or in person, if they immediately thought feminine or female. Oh, that's a good question. Um, spiders are exquisite weavers as her mother was. Mm -hmm. Good connection there. Mm -hmm. So Louise Bourgeois also does did really personal um, sculptures that related to her life and her personal um, trauma and her childhood. Um, we know that her father uh, had an affair. And so she, while she had a strong relationship with her father for while she was growing up, um, she really felt she found the strength in her mother really. So there's a connection between um, mother and child in this sense. Okay, so I've got some more information about Louise Bourgeois here. Now she has uh, definitely been championed as a feminist artist, although she has not always uh, thought so as well. So there's a quote here on the bottom um, that she said that some of my works are or try to be feminist and others are not feminist. She's also said at a different time that she's not a feminist, but she, you know, she doesn't like to be labeled and a lot of artists don't. Um, and, and like she said, some of her work is not about that. But um, 
we have, she was a French, um, she was born in Paris. She was a French artist. Um, she married Robert Goldwater, uh, an art historian, and moved to New York in the late 1930s. So throughout, she, she's been an artist this whole time, but she didn't really become a famous artist until she was in her 50s. Um, so during that time, she was also focusing on being a wife and a mother and, and raising her children. Um, and she explored in her artwork human emotions, um, in particular loneliness, fear, jealousy, anger, sexuality, the body, and death and her childhood memories and trauma. But I'd also say that she includes a little tongue in cheek humor in her pieces too. And how her art connects to feminism is that she addresses women's roles as a homemaker through a sense of imprisonment in the home. And she also engaged uh, concepts of female sexuality, which has always been um, historically been taboo subject. So I have one more piece um, or a couple of pieces to look at, and I'm, I'm curious um, if you connect any of these ideas on our bio to these ones. These are the Femme Maison series or um, Women Houses. Yeah, feel Did free we have... to type in the chat yeah. um, what you notice in, this, in these works. Did we have any other comments on Spider that I, I thought I said coming through? I think um, someone was commenting about your question as to whether um, they thought of the spider as a female mm -hmm. and, and the reference to being protective or defensive um, or dainty and both as all women can be, says Nancy, mm -hmm. and that the spider was fierce and angular. And I, I'd say the first time I saw it, I didn't immediately think woman, that's a female spider there. Um, but hearing the story, I connected a little bit more with um, the, the kind of common saying in connection of a, a mother bear um, who is protective of its cubs. It can be very fierce and very scary, but also feminine and, and it's very much a, a caregiver. Any thoughts on these uh, Femmeson, these women houses? No one shared yet. Well, the first thing I think when I when I've seen these is that these women are too big for these houses, right? Literally, um, but also figuratively. Um, you know, and or they've got the house on their mind in that the, the first two are just covering their, their heads. Um, so they live and work in these spaces, but that's not all of who they are, right? Michelle says women carry the weight and responsibility for households. Mm -hmm. What did you think, Carly, when you first saw them? Yeah, I definitely immediately connected the, the weight of the responsibility, as Michelle says, of the house. Um, and I was also curious, I see the same shape of, it's, it almost looks like steam blowing out of the house um, mm -hmm. in the first two images. And that, I just had questions about that as to what that could mean. Um, and I guess I connected it to wanting to blow off steam. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Mm -hmm. <laughs> or stress, um, but it, it could be something different or mean something else to others. Um, I like the, the image, the third image, I'm curious about the positioning of the legs and the arms in that image, almost as if it's a free fall. Mm. So I think I had thought that it kind of looked insect-like. <laughs> mm -hmm. And yeah, I think that that one might might reference her um, the like an apartment in New York City where she and her family lived. But I also I I also think about um, how these women are trapped inside these houses, especially that third one. I I get really claustrophobic if I think about it too much. Um, Michelle's questioning why the legs behind the red screen on the first image. 
I barely noticed the legs until I started to look even closer. And then I had the same question. Yeah, that's a good question. Um, it could be a, a red screen. It also almost looks like there's a flower growing up from it. So maybe did, is this woman homeless? Is, is this woman escaping? Um, lots of potential there. Cindy says trapped in the house, body is naked and very vulnerable. Yeah, vulnerability too, yeah. Yeah, and it almost looks like there's a, a third arm coming out of the third one, um, the like apartment building. So is there a young woman who's starting to grow up and get trapped in there too? Or um, what's, what's going on with that one? So these mm -hmm. are, yeah, these are mysterious as well as um, some obvious references. Okay, great. Let's move on to Kiki Smith. And we'll, I'll give you a moment to look and then just type in the chat, what do you see? Linda says she sees movement and balance. Yeah, I think that's a good observation with the arms out. You kind of have is kind of referencing to balance. A woman trying to find her way. Mm. Right, with the hands out. Yeah, it's almost as if. And, and if you look at the title, the Sleepwalker, it could be very literally, maybe she's um, moving in the dark. We just happen to be looking at her during the day. Interesting hunch in the shoulders. Caution, maybe? Mm. Her head and all that long hair are kind of out of proportion with the body. It is, yeah. So she likes to... to manipulate the proportion a little bit. What do you think that means? And what else do you see? Or what do you wonder about this piece? Finding her way, says Linda. I've always noticed the proportions being a little bit off and the, the long hair that kind of, it almost looks like it's wet or it's dreaded because it looks heavy on the body. Jess says the proportion makes her look sort of doll-like or not quite real. Mm. Mm. And Linnea is wondering, what would she say if she could speak? Oh, I wonder that too. If yeah, it is a sleepwalker. I always wonder um, what she's dreaming about. Mm. Michelle says, does the larger head show emphasis on a dream space or being in her head? Yeah, I like that. And that's kind of often what I've wondered or thought that it's a bit of a surreal moment of maybe halfway in between the dream world and this world. Nancy from Facebook says, I wonder um, what's ahead of her that she seems to sense with her outstretched arms. Mm -hmm. And Holly says, I wonder where she is going or if she can see. Yeah. Yeah. Have you ever been halfway in the dark and feeling around? You still somehow manage to find that spot to stub your toe or to walk into something um, or a feeling of there's there's something not good just out of my eyesight. I too wonder um, in this context with the proportions, um, if it's a statement about not trusting yourself, 
not Mm -hmm. trusting your feet, you know, like be sure of yourself, be sure of your footing, but that with the proportions, it makes me wonder if that's a statement of insecurity as well. Mm. Yeah, I had a recent um, scare in my house and uh, just the house was unlocked and my TV was on. Um, And so I went around the house very nervous and kind of um, what I thought about later is I was in my head of thinking about all the horror movies I watch and uh, you know some scary monster might jump out of me and that's um, we hear that term in your head a lot so I wonder if she's in her head well let's talk about Kiki Smith a bit so She was the daughter, is the daughter of American sculptor Tony Smith and Jane Lawrence, who is an actress and opera singer. So she grew up in an artistic world and she's largely self-taught and and taught from her personal experiences in the art world. uh, but she, she, her artwork is very, very different from her father's. Tony Smith worked in the minimalist movement. We have a piece of his here as well. Um, but she explored the Catholic obsession with the body um, in her art early work. So focused on um, bodily functions and in particular women in the midst of bodily functions and how um, it's not okay. It's so very taboo for um, women to have these naturally bodily functions where it doesn't seem to be as much of an issue for men. Um, But she also had a painful relationship with illness and death. Um, A lot of her loved ones died um, when she was younger. And then through her art, she, her early works, um, address that female bodily functions as a stigma. But then her um, work has gotten a little more subtle in the connection with feminism. And she's exploring the the quote unquote wild nature of women. And this can go back to, you know, the middle ages and beyond of how women, if they did anything out of what is expected of them, out of the norm, they might be accused of being a witch. And that um, could be so harmful that they'd even be put to death. Um, And then this, this dichotomy between a woman who is prim and proper versus any woman who does anything else is a wild woman. Um, And then I I like her quote here too, um, because her artwork had been labeled feminist and and kind of directly part of that movement. Um, But she said, as an artist, I just wanna go wherever nutty place my work wants to go and not think about it. So if if she's making animal figures, then it it doesn't necessarily fit in with that movement, the feminist movement. And uh, so she also doesn't love the labels either. And then another image by Kiki Smith here. This one is called Rapture. And um, I'm wondering what you see with this piece and or what you wonder or how you might incorporate those ideas of feminism into this piece. Or just learning about um, her bio, if that changes how you feel about Sleepwalker even. Anita says, interesting piece to say the least. Yeah. (laughs) I'll give a, a very basic description of what's happening here in case you can't tell the animal on the floor is a wolf. So we have a nude woman coming out of, it looks like, of a wolf. She still has one leg inside of the body. Um, Good Heart Artist Residency says, women defeating alpha male. Mm, A woman who has defeated an alpha male. Interesting. Jess says this one explores the concept of a wild woman for sure. A wild woman. 
So I think it's interesting that someone brought up the alpha male because as Carly and I, you and I were talking about before and um, a wolf is often associated with masculinity, right? And the in a pack, there's an alpha male who controls a wolf pack. So interesting. Um, and Martha says wolf metamorphizing into a woman. So and, um, Michelle says the texture of the woman and the wolf are an interesting contrast. It is. Yeah. You have the really smooth surface of the woman versus a very rough texture of the wolf. Yeah. And I think um, one point that kind of brought up to that idea of a wolf that is a, is a predator versus a woman who's usually seen as this dainty feminism or female concept. So I'll add uh, that after hearing a little bit more about Kiki Smith and this connection to the, the wild woman or a woman who is running on instincts, that changes how I feel a little bit about sleepwalker because it is a woman who, who is, you know, when you're sleepwalking, you are, you are moving based on instincts and kind of, so there's this connection to a woman in the wild or who is letting herself be wild in a some small way. Yeah, I saw I, I, this sculpture um, actually makes me feel powerful as a woman. I connect to that as if it's um, the woman was inside the wolf all along. Mm -hmm. And so it's like a, a statement of power. So I saw it kind of as a reversal from Martha of the, the woman is actually, you know, kind of coming out of the shell. So finding her wild in a positive way. Hmm. Linda asks, who is in rapture? That is a good question. How do you apply that title to this? Carly there's and so I, many ways. Yeah, there are so many ways. <laughs> Carly and I were talking a little bit before this and wondering if there's a connection to the rapture and maybe this is a post-apocalyptic situation. And then what does that mean for the role of women? Yeah, lots of options with this one. Okay. I'm trying to give a little bit of time for there's a delay on Facebook. So yeah. um, for those comments on Facebook, but we can always come back to them too. Next is Beverly Pepper. So what do you see here? This is image, this um, sculpture is called Galileo's Wedge. What do you see and what do you wonder? It's quite a, I, I just realized it's quite a change <laughs> right. from the past two pieces. It's very different. Very different. Much more minimalist. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I just love this image of uh, our coworker in there <laughs> looking up at it. You get a sense of scale and how large this piece really is. No thoughts yet or noticing. Maybe it's because it, it, it is so simple. It is it is a um, very large, if we're looking at the, the title, a wedge is a simple tool. You see that it comes to a bit of a point at the top. Anybody have any thoughts on why it might be so large? Jess says, I wonder if one person made it for a team. Um, Facebook, Nancy says, larger than life. I see a wedge into the sky. I wonder what is being split. Mm. Just wondering the connection to femininity. Mm. A rising blade. 
Yes, I am curious if if anyone has any thoughts on the connection to uh, feminism or femininity with this piece, or does it does it automatically feel opposed to ideas of femininity? It is it's a tool. It's a simple tool, and a lot of times in um, our society, we associate tools with men and masculinity. And I like those other observations. What is it splitting? Is it splitting the sky or is it meant to? Who would use such a large tool? Yeah, I'm also wondering if there is a statement. Oh, Michelle says wedges divide. So is there a statement on division? there mm -hmm. who's and using the wedge do. yeah well let's look at her bio slide we might be able to make some more sense of this piece so i love this image of beverly pepper too <laughs> Um, so she was a child of Jewish immigrants who grew, growing up in New York. Um, she studied painting in Paris and didn't, I mean, she, she made a bit of a career out of it, but wasn't wildly successful um, until she went to uh, Cambodia and visited Angkor Wat, which is a religious space. And um, she had a bit of a spiritual epiphany there. And at that point, her work uh, was imbued with with a sense of spirituality. And she wanted to work with metal and she learned to weld by working in a factory and, and learned the, the tricks in the trade um, in that way. Yeah, and I had a question, Amber. Um, from what I read, it was that epiphany that moved her from painting to sculpture. Is yeah. that true? Yeah. Okay. Mm -hmm. Um, she just didn't feel like she could capture that sense of spirituality in, in her paintings. And then um, how does her work connect to feminism? Well, the work itself, the artwork, doesn't necessarily. Um, it doesn't address f femininity or her role as a woman. Um, she has never, you know, this is a quote from her, she never thought of herself as a female sculptor, just a sculptor. And she never thought of herself as a feminist, but she just wanted to be treated as an equal, which is kind of the definition of, of a feminist. But um, her, the, she was labeled a feminist artist because she was working with metal, which is considered man's, man's work at the time. So I'm gonna come back to Galileo's Wedge. Um, so knowing a little bit about that, um, does that change how you feel about this piece at all? It definitely does for me. So my first thought too, that comes to mind when I hear a little bit about this or just hear that um, her metal sculptures are imbued with a sense of spirituality and the scale of this makes me again think of who is this made for? Martha says, no frills, simple geometric shape. Yeah, it is. The, the monumental size of this sculpture makes me appreciate the sculptor whether it's a male or a female. Mm -hmm. um, but definitely, I would be curious to hear about uh, the process in making a sculpture this size. Um, yeah, and it, sorry, this one being made in 2009, she's wildly popular artist at this point. This was definitely made by a team of people, um, but she started making large scale pieces on her own. Mm -hmm. Michelle says it shows her personal strength and confidence. Yeah. And Jess says it's powerful. It takes up physical and vis visual space. It can't be ignored. Yeah. Oh, and Mary says Galileo's theories were a wedge for the church teachings. That is true. Yeah. Adding Galileo in there. So, and he's also um, 
looking at space in, in his time. And I, I think about the monumentality of this in with the, um, the earthworks of ancient um, Inca artists, I wanna say Inca, um, they're so big because they're meant for the gods. You know, yeah. so. Linnea has another interesting observation that the, the shadows seem to paint the sculpture, which I've mm. never thought about before, but yeah. Yeah, a, a lot of her work really does. It was meant to be outside from the get-go. So there is a connection with natural light and how it hits the, the piece. I like that. Okay, well, let's look at another piece by her or a couple pieces. This is this one's called uh, Split Ritual 2. And it, it can be a bit non-objective. It doesn't look like anything specifically, but it also might remind us of stuff. And then using incorporating the title into it. I'm curious, what do you see and what do you wonder? I will say I had a hard time choosing which one piece to show that that represents Beverly Pepper's other work because she worked in all sorts of metal, although um, there's been a little bit of debate and discussion on she thought she was the first person to use Corten steel um, as a medium. Uh, there's a few other people that claim that as well, but it was definitely innovative for the time. Um, it looks like it rusts, but it isn't breaking down chemically. So there, there's definitely an, in, um, a connection to industrialism and that industrial material. Oh, Linda's wondering, are they sculpture tools? Hmm. They, they still have that tool-like quality here, yeah. Just says that it looks like Roman columns, like a relic of a temple or mm -hmm. another building. Interesting. I hadn't thought of it that way, and that's my forte. Um, yeah, so there's these tholos temples that just means it's built in the round, and they're usually, if they're built in the round, they're usually a tomb. So that's interesting to think about too. What do you think about the split ritual part? Right. I was just reflecting on that in the position of the sculpture and they're in a circle facing each other is what I see. Mm -hmm. There's two different shapes um, kind of next to one another. You have the curved one versus the more straight topped geometric. So they're could be a reference to masculinity and femininity. There could be, the, that's, that word ritual often reminds me of a, a religious ceremony. So usually rituals are done um, in a religious setting. Not always, but. So I think that again, you get that sense of spirituality. Michelle says, it seems they stand together, but each hold their own ground, split in commitment to each other. Ooh, very thoughtful. I like that. Each piece is split down the middle, but still looks solid and strong. Mm. Okay. I really like that. I really like the, the discussion we had here today. And we're gonna leave you with a, a thought. Um, a lot of historians say that we're in the midst of a fourth wave of feminism that's developing now. There's a focus on intersectionality of gender identity and race, um, you know, in the women's right to vote um, was not inclusive in that it was very much a movement for white women. Um, so there are a lot of people that feel we need to include ideas of gender identity and race in those 
in um, our search for equality. And then the question we ask is, have we reached the call to equality that was addressed by these artists? And uh, is there more work to be done? And this is a question that you can take with you when you look at other artwork by female artists as well. Um, and, you know, we don't have to put every uh, piece of artwork in a box as feminist or not feminist, but a lot of of women explore um, their role as women. And uh, we should always ask these kinds of questions, I think. And then Amber, if you wouldn't mind advancing to the next slide. Um, our next Zooming in is a um, virtual writing workshop. So if you're able to join us in April, um, also stay tuned on our website and Facebook page for more virtual visits every month. And if you're able to donate and pay what you can today. I popped the link in the chat for that. And we're interested in your feedback feedback on these Zooming in visits. So I'm gonna pop that link in the chat for the feedback form as well. Um, and I'll add real quick that um, zooming in on Haiku, we have an image of a Jenny Holzer piece that has poetry on it. And Jenny Holzer is another artist who has been labeled a feminist and adds semiotics into her artwork and looking at the, the written word um, and how that connects to her artwork. Yeah, I'm excited to dig more into that in April too. Well, thank you so much, Amber. And thank you so much, everyone who joined us today. And we hope you have a beautiful week. Thank you. Bye.